This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, where we read and encourage you to read books. So it's basically a book review show, and every week we go through books large and small. We just finished actually a nice four-week segment on uh, Murray Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty with a variety of guests. So that was fun. And for the most part, as I'm sure you're aware, we read books, oftentimes by dead guys, uh, oftentimes years, decades, sometimes even centuries old, because obviously we have a bit of a bias in terms of books which have stood the test of time. But that said, every once in a while, we like to sort of indulge ourselves with a new or a current book from an author who is very much alive and kicking. And that's what we've got this week. We've got the great John Tamney. I'm sure a lot of you, our listeners here at Mises.org, know his name. He is, of course, the editor-in-chief of Real Clear Markets. And uh, he is also a vice president at FreedomWorks. He is an author of several books. But the book in question today is his most recent. And as I mentioned, hot off the presses, this is a 2021 book called When Politicians Panicked uh, by John Tamney, published by Post Hill Press. And John, you know, I finished the book over the weekend. I got to tell you, one thing that struck me as sort of an overall uh, uh, takeaway from this book was that it reminds me of David Stockman's Great Deformation in that what how that book described much of the 08 financial crisis surrounding Lehman and the Treasury and the Fed and kind of a blow-by-blow account. I think this book, it very much does that same thing uh, about the coronavirus reaction by government and the Treasury and the Fed in that March 2020 timeframe. Well, thank you. That that makes my day. Um, I, I That was my intent. I have written in what I think is an economics book. Uh, many, many thousands probably of medical books will be written. To me, this is an economic story. Uh, economic growth is easily the biggest enemy of death and disease. Poverty is the biggest killer. And so you cannot talk about what they did, what uh, panicky politicians did in 2020 without contemplating at length the lengths they went to contract the economy and 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 how that just set us back in such cruel and mean ways that uh, we'll be realizing probably for decades ahead. Well, it is an economics book. It has a lot of facts, a lot of sites, not boring at all, moves along at a very good pace. I, I think the chapter length was right for this kind of book. But, you know, I'm sure you felt this frustration that economists failed us over the past year. In other words, part of their job, the job of any social scientist, is to show us the unseen. The seen is easy. The unseen is not so easy. And of course, this is, we're, the unseen is going to linger for years or decades with the, with the, when it comes to coronavirus lockdowns. Uh, un- unquestionably. And, and I get so annoyed when I hear people, even in my world, say, oh, he's a great economist or he's a good economist. To me, that's like saying he's a good astrologist. I mean, really, this is common sense we're talking about. Uh, People produce, they produce because they want to get things. If you want them to produce more, remove the barriers to their production. Uh, Governments cannot give what they haven't taken from us first. So to pretend that governments can contract an economy only to revive it by uh, doling out monies they extracted from us first defies basic common sense. Now, of course, economists were asleep at the switch on, on this one precisely because just about every economist of credentialed quality on earth believes that government spending grows the economy. Just about every economist believes that death and destruction, that that, uh, war actually grows the economy. So is it any surprise that they would believe in this case that politicians extracting trillions from an economy they they needlessly wrecked uh, would somehow believe that that was the answer uh, to the, the wreckage that politicians caused? Do you think we will someday get accurate data on some of these unseen effects, like, for instance, the amount of undiagnosed heart disease and cancer because people weren't going to the doctor? Do you think that'll become part of the fog of all of this? It's such a good question, and and I think about it all the time, and my answer to you is no, and that's what's so tragic about this. And the reason it's no is consider, once again, the trillions of dollars extracted from the private economy so that politicians, obviously guilty at what that the immense damage they've done in such short order, 
could basically throw money at their mistakes. Uh, we know, we and you know this intimately as an Austrian thinker. Austrians put the entrepreneur so often at the center of their universe. Entrepreneurs, as a rule, are doing what everyone rejects, what everyone thinks is ludicrous most of the time. And so they only get the rarest of intrepid funds. And so the question, we'll never know the experiments that did not take place to move us along toward cancer and other cures. And much the same, you know, we'll just, we'll never know what people didn't do, the doctors they didn't visit, uh, that had they, uh, they, they would have, they, they, they would be healthier now, or, that, or, that, or something would have been detected now that would have saved them from a lot of misery down the line. It's truly tragic. But of course, it's not just health, it's also time and wealth, which were squandered. I mean, you shut down the world for a year, uh, there are young people, for example, that lost, let's say, a, a teen year or college students. And there are companies which weren't started and there are entrepreneurs who were squelched. I mean, it's, it's, it gets a little scary when you start to think about how far reaching it might all be. Oh, there's no doubt. Warren Buffett doesn't agree with us on everything, but his insights from a young age about time, which you allude to just now, were brilliant. He recognized that with time, all manner of wealth could be created, uh, but you had to be willing to, to be patient. And so when you take away what is so precious for a year, where basically you put, uh, take a break from reality for a year, put things on ice, uh, boy, what a, what a rich nation we've become. In a sense, we should be staggered by the wealth that enabled something so abjectly stupid. But at the same time, we have to wonder, what did we not achieve? The unseen is, is endless here. Uh, but as you point out, economists don't think about the unseen. They just want politicians to do things, and politicians want them to want politicians to do things. Well, one thing I found funny in your book is you know, we have the information age now. We have almost instantaneous information available at our fingertips, even for something that happens in China, for example. And you mentioned that as late as February of 2020, even into March, we had voices as diverse as Trump and Anna Wintour, Wintour I don't know how you say her name, and the New York Times and, and uh, Nancy Pelosi and all these people and Fauci even to an extent saying, hey, you know, COVID's no big deal. And yet in an Internet age, you'd think that we would hold them to that and that would stand out more. And we'd say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We remember. The Internet remembers um, what you were saying just a couple of months back, but it, it didn't seem to happen. We, it's, it's a fair point, but I would almost argue to you that we did do that. Uh, I make clear in the book that I get the vast majority of my information from The New York Times. And, and I did because I wanted to check on my passion from day one that these were just the lockdowns were disastrous. But I found most of that information that you just alluded to um, in The New York Times. It was all there, uh, but I, I think we would probably agree the mistake isn't ever going to politicians for guidance in the first place. What could Donald Trump possibly know about viruses? What what could Anwin Tour? But what what do the people know? Well, the people are the marketplace, and it's if we believe in free markets during good times and free markets beget good times. We have to believe and double down in our belief during bad times because free people produce information. And when we needed them most, when we needed free people to produce information about the virus as a danger, as a big deal, or as not a big deal, basically we shut down the very producers of information that could have given us uh, the, the path out of what some deemed a major crisis. Well, and as you explained, I mean, I think the average American imagines that there were just thousands of bodies stacked up in the Wuhan province, when in fact, we have American companies operating over there giving us real-time data that that's not the case. And as you, as you suggest, um, once, the, uh, you know, once markets got a hold of that information, they regained. Uh, without question, uh, market signals are so powerful, and I find it frustrating. I think both sides are... Uh, are uh, uh, guilty of this. They love market signals until market signals disagree with with, with whatever uh, crisis crisis they think is before us. But in this case, uh, people can love or hate China, but what they cannot deny is that China is the second largest market for the most valuable companies in the world. That would be U.S. companies, 
if the virus had been a major killer, we would have known it in the fall of 2019. Certainly by late fall, we would have known it with U.S. share prices plummeting to reflect uh, indiscriminate death uh, from an unknown virus in the biggest market. But in fact, U.S. shares were hitting, hitting all, all-time highs then, and they were hitting all-time highs uh, right through uh, March uh, until politicians decided to act. Let's never forget the virus had been spreading for months. It was a known quantity. Markets had discounted it. They only corrected once politicians started to act and take away our freedoms, and we, which no one would, should surprise no one. Markets for markets make big moves in response to surprise. No one could have predicted. Right, no one politicians could, predicted, could I think. do something uh, so but you immensely point out damaging. That not they too much earlier. I think it was February twenty seventh of twenty twenty. We had all time stock market highs, and you credit this at least in part to the idea that uh, something which might worry markets would be the candidacy of. Uh, Bernie Sanders for president had been somewhat squashed then by a Biden victory in one of the primaries. Um, so do you think that that um, do, do you stand by that? Do you think that that was that was why, despite Trump, despite all the nastiness, even before covid, it was shaping up to be a nasty political year that markets were telling us that, hey, it's probably going to be Biden or maybe Trump. And so we're OK. And, and that five or 10 years hence, um, we're, we're going to signal that things are going to be good. If someone's on the rise politically, investors need to respond ahead of time. Markets don't wait. They start to adjust to potentialities. And so some people listening now can say, oh, is he joking? Bernie Sanders never had a chance. But remember, back in February, it was apparent that he was about to run away with it. Uh, remember, people were telling Biden to drop out. There were stories about how Joe Biden was meeting with his top staffers in, I believe, Philadelphia, uh, making plans for next steps uh, about not being in the race. And so, uh, at the time, there was the possibility that Bernie Sanders was going to be the Democratic nominee. And people can say, well, he could never have beaten Trump. Well, sure, but that's exactly what they said about Trump versus Hillary. <laughs> Look what happened there. So their markets were discounting it. And then, as I point out, um, and this is why I believe so strongly in my thesis is Biden wins on a Saturday. He wins South Carolina kind of going away the following Monday. Stocks have their biggest one day, at least in nominal points gain in the, in the Dow in history. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, suddenly you had a, a certainty, uh, an uncertainty erased from, from the presidential race, which was the possibility of a socialist winning the White House. So we didn't have to worry about the name. People can love or hate Biden. But ultimately, Biden is a typical known Washington deal maker. To pretend that he's some major ideologue, ideologue is just to misunderstand history and misunderstand everything about him. So as March unfolds and they start wavering and changing their tunes, and there's, you know, there's a couple of interesting points. Is first of all, some private sector uh, CEOs and such begin to announce their own shutdowns and sending people home from work, which while we still had imperfect information makes sense in a market and a PR uh, sense of the term. And so your point is that we didn't need government edicts to make people do what they want to do and what they believe is in their interest to do. And then second of all, um, of course, you have our friends on both the left and the right clamoring for government to do something, which is what happens with every crisis, real or imagined. And do something takes the form of either fiscal or monetary stimulus. And you go into some length talking about uh, Kevin Warsh at Hoover and Jason Furman, uh, both of whom wrote in the Wall Street Journal op-eds coming at this from fiscal or, or monetary side. And they come up with this mantra, which it's a word that drives me insane, John, liquidity. Uh, it just drives me insane. So so talk about this sort of predictable response from the Glenn Hubbards and the Kevin Warshes on the left and the Jason Furmans and the Steve Ratners, excuse me, on the right and the, the uh, Jason Furmans and the Steve Ratners on the left. Give us sort of the big picture of the monetary and fiscal proposals which were happening. Well, thank you, first of all, for hating the word liquidity. I am with you all the way there. Liquidity can't be decreed by government. That's like saying government can decree cheap rents. Liquidity is a consequence uh, where there's uh, there are 
active, vibrant, free markets, there's generally liquidity. Where there aren't, there's not going to be any liquidity. And so that's what we had in March of 2020. Out of nowhere, uh, 25% of the world's most dynamic economy was shut down. And so you have Kevin Warsh going uh, on the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, and the and Journal's editorialists agreeing with him that the Fed had to step in and liquefy businesses that suddenly found capital markets closed to them. Well, you think they're closed to you? Uh, yeah, out of nowhere, it's decreed that you can't operate your business. And governors were quite literally saying, if you operate your business, we're going to shut off electricity to you. Yeah, that would tend to result in an anti-liquidity event. And so Warsh is talking non sequiturs. And then you have uh, Jason Furman on the other side saying that we can't miss this chance in history to dole out billions and I think it was trillions of dollars to every American to put money in their pockets so they spend during this downturn. Or well, first of all, where were they going to spend it? But second of all, spending doesn't drive economic growth. Investment does. Third of all, the production already happened. That's why government would have trillions to dole out. What you want during an economic, during a forced contraction is you want that powder on the sidelines ready to invest in businesses once the lockdowns end. But the broad point here is there's no liquidity problem. There were lockdowns. If you, if you wanted to reverse the liquidity problem, you couldn't do it by decree or by the Fed. You do it by getting the government out of the way. And, and neither side understood this. Did you ever hear from Warsh or Furman about your critiques? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I've, I've met Warsh a few times out at Hoover. Um, he's very dismissive because he I've been critiquing him for years. He's been kind of a muse, um, but uh, certainly not from Furman. I guess I don't rate their their disdain, but I, I wish they would respond just because it might the, those two debating those two might be the two easiest debates I'd ever I'd ever I could ever possibly have. So divorced from reality and their their views on economics. And so for our listeners, Furman is a professor, and Warsh is a former Fed uh, vice president or governor. Yeah, he was a he was, Warsh was vice chairman. He was appointed uh, by George W. Bush at the Fed. A uh, very well married uh, person. His wife is Erin Lauder, uh, the cosmetics heiress. Uh, very uh, well spoken, attractive guy. Uh, uh, fits the mold, I suppose. Although probably not of a Fed person. And then Jason Furman was Barack Obama's uh, CEA chief. Uh, again, another very well bred, well spoken person. Uh, just doesn't have a clue about economics. And so their solution was. Uh, government to base throw money at problems of government's own making. Well, uh, sorry, there's no so government has no resources that it can extract other than what it takes from us. And so, the idea that you can revive an economy by throwing money at businesses that were being shut down by government uh, kind of defies basic common sense. And the lockdowns, and you don't have this problem. And let me just be clear about why this is. There, there's a myth out there that businesses run out of money. Well, as I argue in the book, uh, no business ever runs out of money. They run out of investor confidence. Remember, for years, Amazon was Amazon.org. It was the company. It was a nonprofit, and there was no path to profits. But investors kept putting money behind it because they saw a future. If people had literally quarantined on their own, which many were doing in response to the virus, with not, not, not being forced, just doing it on their own, some businesses were going to suffer. And as you point out, you know, a, a large businesses were probably going to shut down to varying degrees in the first place. Nothing wrong with that. Capital markets can fund for that kind of thing. They do that all the time. The problem in this case is the businesses were shut down and there was no evidence, there was no knowledge of when government was going to allow them to start operating again. Kind of hard to raise money in that environment. But this mania for liquidity, it just shows you that it, it, it seems like somehow bizarrely that both left and right in, in this country have lost sight of production and that somehow it's about money rather than goods and services being produced in better and, and faster and cheaper and more efficient ways. I mean, there's no other way to explain this idea that if we just have more money, that somehow we will magically have more goods and services in society, or at least sustain goods and services. And of course, that's two very different things. Oh, you're so right. I, I always remind people, uh, particularly the ones focused on the Fed, and, and that is most certainly worse, but just people in general, 
if you've got a productive idea, if you've got a brilliant idea, don't worry about it. Sources of finance will beat a path to your door. Uh, There's a reason that investment banking is so lucrative. It's so lucrative because it is so competitive among these investment bankers fighting with each other to see who can match talented people with capital. And so there's this idea that money will solve it. No, no, no. Money is the consequence of intriguing ideas. Uh, But when you're not allowed to be productive, rest assured that money is not going to find you. And if you're not productive, rest assured that money will not find you. There's never any liquidity in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And there never will be. The Fed can't alter that. No one can alter that. Liquidity is a consequence. Uh, Guys like Warsh put the cart before the horse. But to be clear, they're not alone. There's this myth out there that the Fed can reshape reality. One of the big points you make in this book, apart from that politicians panicked and they fell for the political trap that they need to do something. But when they did do something, namely fiscal and monetary stimulus, so-called, they did the wrong thing. And what they did was to position the Fed and the Treasury as investors, when in fact during a crisis is when we need the wisdom, especially the handicapping of the future of markets and that discipline more than any other time. So, I mean, you... And I don't want to speak for you, but one thing that I took away from this book, something I've actually said myself at a conference, was that the analysis wouldn't change if there had been a million or five million or 10 million deaths in the United States. I mean, the reaction would have changed, but the analysis of what we should do wouldn't change. No, no, wouldn't at all. It, it, it's so I'm so glad that you brought that up about the number of deaths. I keep reminding people that the more deaths projected or the more deaths that actually happen would make an even better argument for freedom. I mean, really, what if it had been true that bodies were just piling up at hospitals across the United States? At that point, what would be the point of any kind of uh, political uh, lockdowns? Uh, People would be locking down on their own. People don't need to be forced to protect themselves from potential death or, or extraordinary illness. But looking at bringing it back to the businesses, Let's never forget that the U.S. is the richest country on earth precisely because businesses die with great regularity in it. We don't generally have sacred cows here. We let what's bad die. And so there was this notion in 2020 that, no, the Treasury and Fed, they will lend to businesses uh, that have good prospects for the future. And again, Democrats and Republicans were buying this line, which was just so beyond reason. Because think about if the lockdowns had happened in the year 2000. Now, I contend in the book that they could never have happened in 2000, different story and subject. But in 2000, what were the most valuable and best companies in America? Well, there was GE, uh, the two best internet companies, and they were dominant, were at Yahoo and AOL. Oh, boy, where are they today? Uh, The best managed company was Enron. Um, The future GE was Tyco. Now, let's be clear, at the same time, Amazon was Amazon.org at the time. Uh, Netflix was such a joke that it couldn't even get Blockbuster to buy it. But see, Blockbuster was a power in 2000. Uh, Am- Apple was near bankrupt and would have died if not for a liquidity infusion from the great Bill Gates. Uh, do we want to go down the list? Google was unknown. Oh, Facebook did. Oh, oh wait, Facebook didn't exist. Mark Zuckerberg was in high school at the time. The point is, there's no way for the Federal Treasury to liquefy or invest in companies. How, it implies that they know what the future is going to be like. And the reality is we can't possibly know. And so they're quite literally, their goal was to freeze in place 2020, which we will be paying the, the, the demand, the, the, the damages for that for the longest time. The reality is lots of businesses were going to die in 2020 regardless of lockdowns, regardless of if there had been a virus spreading, yet we didn't get the chance to let businesses be put out to pasture to the economy's better betterment uh, last year. Just tragic. Well, I'd like to talk about your two chapters in particular, which go deeper into the Fed. That's chapters 14 and 15 in the book. I think an important point you make early on is like, okay, we can certainly reach a point, and I would argue we started to reach that after the 07, 08 crash, where the Fed just doesn't have all that much impact on the economy. Banks no longer really borrow from each other overnight. So there's not much point to the uh, interest rate targeting of the overnight Fed funds rate. 
And I agree with your point where you say, you know, the, the rate at which banks lend to each other overnight doesn't have much effect on investor valuation of a big company like Amazon, which they calculate in their own way, I suppose, in the manner you suggest that in uh, Peter Thiel zero to one, what, what, you know, what's the discounted value of all the future earnings of a company? I, I agree with that, I guess, in the broader abstract sense. But what's interesting is that, look, you've got an economy that's shutting down literally by fiat. So it's not, a, at that point, it's not about liquidity or, uh, uh, you know, a lending facility. It's about credit worthiness. And we saw this in 0708 with housing. You know, all of a sudden it was hard to get a home loan. So, the, you know, you can't make banks lend, I guess. You can't push on a string. I think that's Janet, Janet Yellen's term. No, you can't. And, and we certainly saw this. Uh, <laughs> the Fed goes to zero in, what, March 12th of last year. And uh, what were banks doing? Banks were pulling back on credit cards. They were just basically disissuing them, taking them out of circulation for some people. Uh, they were limiting all, all manner of um, home equity lines of credit. Uh, the Fed can go to zero, but that's like saying, OK, well, Bill de Blasio can go to 1000 a month top rent in Manhattan. Yeah, lots of demand for that, very little supply. And so to me, every time the Fed goes to zero or whatever that is, that's just a sign that money is tight, that banks are only going to take the, 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 the most minimal of risks. Basically, they're going to lend to businesses that already have access to funds in the capital markets. And of, and of course, that's what they did. Uh, the Fed can't alter reality. It can't make money easy uh, as much as people want to believe that it can. Okay, but what's the John Tamney take on the Fed's balance sheet? And, and one thing that was different this time around, a uh, QE back as we think about it back in the day of 0708 was was a lot of treasury debt and it was a lot of toxic mortgage debt from banks but this time around uh the fed's balance sheet has included some new things like muni debt and corporate debt and as you point out it went from you know it tapered a little bit it had gotten to about 4 trillion a little more and now it's up what over 7 um i i'm not sure but i think you're going to tell me it doesn't much matter um, I think the Fed follows. I don't think the Fed leads. Uh, if you look at what it was buying back in 07, 08, let's never forget that all that toxic mortgage debt, most of it performed. As you'd expect, housing's low risk. When banks uh, rushed toward housing in the 2000s, that was a rush away from risk. Uh, over 90%, well north of 90% of the loans issued during those frothy years back then performed. And so it's somewhat easy for the Fed to take on that kind of debt in the first place. Uh, treasuries, yeah, well, you know, treasuries are backed by the most productive people on earth. Uh, you know, the, the Russia's got 190 billion in total debt. Uh, the U.S. has 30 trillion in total debt. Is Vladimir Putin um, just really good and, 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 and careful about the taxpayers' money? Or does Russia have no borrowing ability? And so to me, there's just not much of a story there. The Fed is searching for relevance. Uh, the Fed is looking for some purpose. As you allude, its Fed funds rate really doesn't matter anymore. It's a bank regulator. Oh, please. Uh, so uh, lender of last resort. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the, the Fed, lender of last resort. No reasonable bank would ever go to the Fed. It's an admission of bankruptcy. And so it's got to look for something to do. So it basically follows other, uh, it, it's a rate follower and buy certain things. I'd rather it not intervene. I don't think the Fed should exist. I just think we overstate its importance. When you talk about how, you know, it, it can't really expand or contract credit through its interest rate lever, I think we, we understand what you're saying here. When you say that people don't really borrow money, uh, they borrow access to real stuff. And I think I largely agree with that, although I think some people just took the PPP loans, for example, and just kept that as cash on their balance sheet for a rainy day. Um, but this idea, I, I think where we might disagree is, you know, you mentioned Mark Thornton. You also mentioned a gentleman at Cato uh, who you feel overstate or exaggerate the idea that, that a low Fed, Fed's fund rate um, tends to juice equity markets. And, and I get your point in that if those equity markets represent a, or the equity market, the price of an equity represents investors' long-term view of the future profits of the company. 
But I, I think I'd push back a little bit and say, I think the Fed has a more distortive effect. Um, and then you say for a couple of reasons, because first of all, I think it creates, I think it really skews M&A. And I worked in M&A for about 20 years. And I think the way that companies are bought and sold today, the, the, the mix of, of uh, the, the uh, capital balance sheet of a company, the mix of debt and equity, I think is skewed by very stubborn l- low rates. And, and I'm sure that you would not dismiss the idea of the Cantillon effect. In other words, there really are people who are sort of closer to the monetary spigot than uh, the average hardworking blue collar folks who were shut down by COVID and that, that they benefit from this proximity to earlier money. So I actually welcome empirical critiques of the Austrian business cycle theory. I don't have a problem with that. But I guess what I want to know is whether you agree with the fundamental idea that rapid credit expansion causes malinvestment. And you seem to almost describe or define malinvestment at page 42. So tell me where you think I'm right and where you think I'm wrong about this. Well, again, the candle on effect. Let's, let's always imagine if the Fed didn't exist. Would certain people and institutions have uh, closer access to the spigot? Well, like like a, a, a gold miner or a Bitcoin miner, I guess. What, what if the Fed didn't exist? Would uh, devaluations not happen? Devaluations are as old as money are. Uh, it, it, uh, if the Fed didn't exist, would banks be bailed out? Oh, I think you know the answer. Uh, would banks be regulated? Would banks... Uh, I just can't, everything that the Fed is blamed for, and I think the Fed absurd. I wrote a book just saying, why, oh my gosh, the people inside it are just some of the most lame brain people, just clueless about economics. But the Fed to me is an outsourced creation of Congress. I I don't see why there's this big focus on it, because anything that it's doing would be happening with or without it. It just exists to do certain things that Congress, kind of like Congress doesn't want to collect taxes, so they create IRS. Oh, okay, but but it also obscures a, a bit because it's viewed as this independent agency. If we just had the, if we didn't have the Fed, and we had w- even more purely political money, and members of Congress on some Treasury uh, money supply committee were, you know, greenbackers. This is the greenbacker concept. We're simply, uh, t- you know, passing bills telling the Treasury what to do with the money supply. And I do like the way you disabuse us of that concept, the money supply. But it, you know, I think. It would be, it would be political, and people at the Mises Institute would probably be saying, "Oh, these guys are terrible," blah blah blah. But I think it would be a tad less opaque to the public. Uh, may, maybe so. Uh, would the public be that interested? Uh, again, it kind of reminds me of the people who say uh, b- businesses with their annual reports should be more uh, should be more open about what they're doing in the annual reports. Oh yeah, because investors look at those. Oh come on, they don't. They don't care. Uh, so I, I don't see a major difference. I don't buy that the Fed can alter reality. Uh, to me, if, if that were true, why is Japan's stock market still half of what it was in the late 80s? Um, is it, are, are their central banker is just not as skillful as Janet Yellen. And, and who's the guy there now? Jerome Powell. Oh, come on. Um, why isn't Europe rallying? They're, they're trying the same financial uh, wizardry that the, the Fed tries. Uh, the difference here is we've got people like Jeff Bezos and we've got people like Steve Jobs and we've got these amazing companies that if you took them out of the market, uh, there wouldn't have been a big rally this year. There wouldn't have big, been a big rally in the past few years. I just don't get why our side's so eager to basically say you didn't build that, uh, but just from a right wing perspective. They don't know the Fed built it. Oh, come on. You know, I uh I, I just I have real trouble buying that. And and so Jim Dorn is making the Yes, that that's that's the name. I'm sorry, that's the name I couldn't remember at Cato. It was James Dorn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh really, Jim? Okay, well explain to me again, explain to me these other countries and explain to me why the Fed was raising rates from what 2014 until oh, I don't know, 2019 and stocks kept hitting all-time highs. But then he sees a rate hike and says, oh yeah, this is why stocks are down. Turned out he was blatantly wrong, which he's always been, um, uh, as are so many of the monetarists out there who think that they can plan money supply, and Jim's one of them. Um, you know, I, I just 
I really think our side can be better at this. And, and uh, I learned most of what I think I know about monetary policy from Mises. I think Mises would agree were he alive. Uh, wh where did I get that line that people borrow money for what it can be exchanged for? From Mises. Basic. No one would be borrowing if there wasn't production. Uh, the lending is a consequence of production. Well, so a couple devil's advocate points. I mean, first of all, someone would point to Japan or other empirical refutations of the idea that low interest rates create stock market booms. When you say, well, Japan had a zombie economy for decades after basically going to zero. I, I think a uh, the the response of a Dorn or maybe a Mark Thornton would be, well, that's because they were, you know, the the central banks have limits to what they can affect, and they were much bigger forces, demographics, bad economy, whatever at play. That you know, just like as you mentioned, when credit's contracting uh, because of credit worthiness, there's nothing a central bank can do to overcome that. But I still have this niggling suspicion that. As you point out, a lot of the stock market rally of the last few years was was largely in the FANG stocks. A lot, you know, a, a big part of the growth was there. It wasn't in the stock market, it's just generally and broadly. But boy, oh boy, when, uh, you know, it, in 1980, let's say, at the height of Paul Volcker's regime at the Fed, people were paying whatever, 18, 20 percent for mortgages. And people were getting 15 percent, let's say, on a simple savings account at a bank. Um, you know, I, I would argue that that, you know, Volcker did have something to do with that. It wasn't simply supply and demand of loanable funds first and second, I second. Know, but okay. But just let, back. okay. Just second real quick is this idea that, you know, when, when you're getting less than 1% on a, a CD and mutual funds, uh, money market funds are pathetic and everything goes, uh, you know, that. I think more people than otherwise do say, hey, I'm going to go check out the stock market. I'm going to put my money in the stock market because, look, I saw Tesla go up again or I saw Facebook go up again. I, I do think there's something not whether the, OK, maybe your argument is correct that the Fed didn't cause it. But when interest rates are very, very low, I do think that increases average people's interest in equity markets because they're looking they're looking for yield. Uh, yeah. Well, again, so what happened in Europe? Were they just not looking for yield there? I mean, I, I, I know what you're saying, but again, what did Mises say? Uh, the, he basically said, I'm paraphrasing, that in any market, the passions of the bulls are always moderated by the passions of the pessimism of the bears. If I'm going to say, oh, well, Rachel, I'm going to search for yield, a la Jim Dorn, I'm going to go into the market and buy stuff. Well, someone's got to sell me. There's not just buyers in any one market. And so we say, okay, well, Japan's different because of demographics. Oh, well, guess what? Let's look at South Korea. Um, worst demographics in the world right now, the lowest birth rate of any developed nation in the world. And oh, by the way, got the highest suicide rate in the world. Where's the big market correction there as a consequence of demographics? Such an argument implies that, that countries are islands as opposed to uh, interconnected parts of a global whole. The reality is that Jeff Bezos could start Amazon in a, in a retirement community today and build a big business simply because we have workers and certainly technology companies have workers around the world doing coding for them. Um, the idea that demographics are the story and that, that explains why, why central banks can't stimulate in those countries. Why are we so afraid to say that actually Jeff Bezos is brilliant? Apple is the, one of the most remarkable companies on earth. Google is a global, globally used brand. Facebook is. Uh, Microsoft. I mean, come on. Uh, is, is Look, this John, the this is the Mises Institute. We encourage people to have babies here, okay? <laughs> I, I want to move on past the Fed. And, and just one quick thing about that. Sure. It's worth pointing out that, yeah, it's famously said that Volcker got rates up to 19%. Oh, come on. Mike Milken at that time was getting lending for MCI at the time, a company that had the temerity to go after AT&T, which was viewed as impregnable at the time. He was getting them financing at rates much lower than 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 that Fed funds rate. And so the point is, the Fed can set whatever rate it wants in the real market. Rates are going to flow the level that they always do. The Fed at zero is just a sign that banks and banks, as we agree, are a small player in total credit, very small, are being very careful with their money. They're basically doing what they've always done, which is lend to institutions that really don't have a major need for it or who are a sure thing to pay back. That's all that is. If the if banks were taking risks, they'd be paying higher interest rates. 
Well, I guess my, my final comment on that is be like Michael Milken. Um, that's, that's good advice for anybody. Be, uh, be, be wealthy. And, and uh, it, well, it's interesting. And you make this point is that all this stuff about stimulus, fiscal or monetary, of course, it's, it's going to go to companies that don't need it. And, and I, I do like the way you disting, you, you disabuse us of this phony distinction between Wall Street and Main Street. This sort of like mom and pop should get the money, uh, and not these big, rich uh, Amazons of the world. And in fact, that's, that's sort of a mentality of stasis that, as you point out, is, look, is looking either at things are at, at present or in the past when we ought to be looking at the future. Absolutely. And uh, let's never forget that most small businesses get their energy from being around large businesses. That's not to say that most large businesses didn't start out small. Of course they do. But there's this, you know, uh, little house on the prairie view, particularly on the right increasingly, that small businesses are the backbone of the U.S. economy. I, I just, I, I mean, I just, I hate stupid thought. And that was one of the dumbest thoughts out there right now. No, 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 no. Small businesses generally cluster around the big ones deal with it. And we know this. Well, go to any shopping mall, look at the anchor tenants, go to any shopping area and notice how it is the big, well-known businesses that, that attract the customers that small businesses feed off. It's just, it's so mindless. And yet our side just loves to get into this corny thought about, you know, farmers and people who in the small towns that they're somehow what make America great. Oh, please. Did you get any, uh, Attacks on the book on that very point that this book is some, you know, a sop to the fat cats or something along those lines. I wish I would. <laughs> yes, I need more people who would disagree with me to read it. Um, I, I'm concerned about that, but it's a debate that I've long wanted to have. Um, and I keep trying to have because I think it's important for people to recognize that big is not bad, that big is what enables. It creates the scenario, scenario whereby someone can start out small. And, and uh, I, it's a debate we need to have so that we can get off this ludicrous uh, thought process that uh, small businesses are, are, are what are going to make the U.S. the or what make the U.S. the greatest economy on Earth. But in terms of the little guy. You have a whole chapter in here about the rich man's coronavirus, where we talk about how a lot of the people behind the shutdowns and the lockdowns were, I guess, what we can call the digerati, which is swell people who work from home or can work from home and stare at a computer all day versus people who work with their hands in skilled trades and construction and being a waitress or cleaning hotel rooms or whatever, and oftentimes paid by the hour. So that if they're just sitting at home, they're not being paid and a $1,200 check is not going to do very much for them. So so it, it seems like this is a, a wedge where we could attack the uh, compassionate left who were overwhelmingly pro-shutdown. It's a great point. It's a great pushback in a sense. What I would, yes, the book is very much about, oh my gosh, what a mean-spirited concept these <laughs> lockdowns were. They basically told those with the least, those with jobs that were gasp, des destinations, those that were working with their hands in varying ways, that you don't matter anymore. Uh, your job doesn't count. Stay home. And if you can't work from home, what's wrong with you? I found that insulting on so many levels. Uh the one quibble, or maybe I would say, I think the way to read that, at least from my book, is I'm not mad at the Digerati. They just created progress for us. It's not their fault that they made life so convenient. It's not their fault that they made it possible for people to quite literally work from home, to watch endless movies from home, to make it to have subhumans deliver them food at home, groceries at home. They're just improving our lives. My dig in the book was more of the basically the middle class and upper middle class that were so comfortable that, oh, wait, you can't do what we can do. And so just the typical person who suddenly were, was able to do his or her job from home. I have a problem with them more than the, the uh, than the Amazons in the world. It's not Jeff Bezos's fault that he's brilliant, but it is the fault of the typical American who said, oh, wait, well, we can work from home and and we can order food and just don't just don't knock on our door. We can't have you touch anything, anything about our house. Just drop the food off and walk away. I have a problem with the middle class in this country for the way they reacted to it. Not not, not the digerati. No, sure. It's great to have two way digital ability at home. There's no question about it. But there's an awful lot of people who worked 
throughout this, people in grocery stores, people at big box stores, people in construction, people in energy, uh, you know, people in maintenance, uh, you know, lots of people went out and, and faced COVID on the front lines. And that's what irritates me is sort of the smug, comfortable people who were at home judging everyone. Oh, yeah, no question. Um, again, it was, uh, they were so worried, they claimed to be so worried about people, except for just don't stop, don't close the grocery stores on us. Don't close the restaurants. Don't close Postmates. You know, the subhumans have to continue working because we need to get our stuff while we're sitting at home. It was the most sickening, obnoxious thing I've ever seen. The rage within me as I wrote about it, as I talk about it now, was endless. This this was just mean spirit. It was snooty. Um, it was just, ugh. So I'm, I'm with you 100 uh, percent. This was wrong. It was, yes, it was very much a rich man's coronavirus to go to the grocery store and see people saying, well, do you have some stuff so we can I want to bake cookies with my daughter. I want to do this. I mean, it's just the arrogance of people. There were real, real people suffering during this. And for the for so many Americans, it was basically a couple months off, uh, you know, hanging out at home with the kids watching Tiger King and everything. And it just it offended me endlessly. Well, I'm definitely with Judge Napolitano, who you bring up in the book. And on the government side, I think some of this borders beyond unconstitutional on, on criminal, but that's a different subject. You know, you mentioned a statistic uh, borne out by folks, or excuse me, it pointed out by folks at Cato that it's possible that as a result of the worldwide poverty uh, or lack of wealth that comes about as a result of the shutdown, and of course, when America gets a cold, the whole world gets a cold because we're such a big part of the global economy. So as many as 135 million people uh, might face some sort of starvation or at least economic calamity as a result of all of this. And I wonder if we have even started to grapple with that, because if that's true, if that's half true, that has to be one of the biggest crimes in human history. Yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, I agree with that. That's my, as I argue in the book, this is the biggest human rights tragedy of the 21st century, and nothing else comes close. Uh, never forget, and and you know this, but it's important for the for the listeners to know this, that when the U.S. takes a break from reality, the rest of the world rushes towards starvation to varying degrees. Because if you go to a country like El Salvador, so much of the consumptive power there emanates from work done in the United States, remittances. Same is true in India. Same is true in, in, in Philippines. These really poor countries, they're reliant on Americans having jobs because uh, these people send money back to their relatives. Well, suddenly that flow didn't stop altogether, but it shrank substantial, substantially. Uh, let's never forget also that when Americans just basically run and hide from a virus, hoping that it will get bored and go somewhere else, um, so much of global production stops. And so people in countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan that were emerging from abject poverty on the way to a piece of something better suddenly saw their ability to progress stop. And so, yes, I just, it's sickening. Um, what they did to the world's most vulnerable as a virus mitigation strategy. So we're going to create economic desperation to fight it. No, economic growth is what kills off viruses. You don't you don't destroy an economy to, and, and you certainly don't destroy the global economy to make people healthier, but that's in fact what they did. Almost time to wrap this up. I want to close talking to you about technocracy. You have a a chapter about experts. And of course, a lot of people, I guess we could say maybe the left, says, well, see you liberty-minded folks, when something terrible comes along like a crisis, that shows why we need you know, strong central government and concerted top-down central action to fight these kinds of things. And I think your point is very Hayekian in that, no, no, no. I mean, this, a crisis like this a absolutely calls out for localized knowledge, uh, for localized information. There's no consensus. We shouldn't be making these sweeping top-down decisions based on early data or limited information. And what we need is a laboratory. We need different states out there operating differently. And maybe a rural area in South Dakota doesn't need the same rules as a densely populated area, et cetera. So I wonder 
if maybe that's a silver lining out of, out of all of this is that people saw that, um, you know, maybe the experts aren't so expert and that maybe they should be looking at things a little more locally. I hope so. Uh, yes, the, if there's a silver lining to this, and I allude to it in the book, is that people will hopefully see or have seen how quickly uh, governments can do major damage. But this is a really important question or comment uh, right here. Uh, imagine uh, Anthony Fauci at, at Nationals Stadium or Nationals Park. It's possible in a packed stadium he's the smartest person in there individually. But the total crowd would be much smarter than Fauci. Uh, because they've just got far exponentially more knowledge collectively. What am I describing more broadly? I'm describing the marketplace. The people are the marketplace. And so politicians say, if we don't act, there will be a crisis. They are engaging in self-fulfilling prophecy because when they act, they are suffocating the market. They're taking away the right of hundreds of millions to make different decisions and produce information and giving decision-making power to the very few. Well, we know from the 20th century that central planning is always a crisis and always brings on desperation, and so it did here. And so we missed out on so much. Freedom doesn't just produce economic growth that creates the resources necessary for doctors and scientists to come up for cure with cures for what used to kill us. Freedom is also the ultimate producer of information, and you want it the most when something like a virus is spreading. There were going to be some people, and you and I know these people. I know people, libertarians, who didn't go to a restaurant for over a year. Well, you know, you need those people. I disagree with them, but they just stopped going. They were terrified. Good. You want to see if that works. There were people like my sometimes exasperating wife who quite literally were jumping off of sidewalks when we'd pass people. I thought it was nuts. Well, you need people like her. You needed people like me. I couldn't wait to go to the grocery store every day. I would forget things on purpose so I could go twice. I wanted to be around people. The masks, I thought, absurd. You need people like you need to find out what happens. And you need young people because they're going to go to every bar and party and make out with every girl. And you got to have them. They're your control group. They're your people who, are, by their living their lives against what the experts want, who are producing information. Is it true what experts think? Because we know from Fauci and the rest, they got AIDS so monumentally wrong in the 80s. And so you need people going against expert opinion to find out what's true. And so when we needed people trying hundreds of millions of different things in 2020, we were instead blinded by lockdowns. They made us less safe. There's never any justification for taking away freedom. And there's certainly the, the arguments for taking away freedom are exponentially worse when a virus or something threatens us. That's when freedom becomes most important. Yet so many people gave it away in 2020. And what a tragedy. Historians will marvel at the abject stupidity of the political class that they, they aired so mightily uh, in, in this instance. Well, I hope they marvel. <laughs> We've got to make sure that I will say this. If Fauci is at Nationals Park, then Max Scherzer is clearly the smartest person in, yeah, that's in right. the stadium. I, l let me ask you this. Is this a political question? How much of the reaction in the U.S., in the media, do you think was just to get Trump? In other words, if, if Hillary had been president and taken the exact same actions, I suspect the media rhetoric would have been far different. I have no doubt you're right that probably the media rhetoric would have been different. That's a given. But I'm not going to use that as an excuse because, A, the rest of the world committed suicide to varying degrees. But, B, we no longer – we can't use that excuse anymore. If you went to my Twitter feed during the lockdowns, if you went to my Facebook feed, you were getting unique, interesting information that the alleged mainstream media wasn't providing. I'll add that the New York Times kept within alarmist articles, kept pointing out that, yeah, half of the deaths associated with the virus are taking place in nursing homes. The Times, kept, you just had to read past the headlines, which would give you the impression of blood in the streets and bodies piled up to see that, oh, yeah, they kept reporting the truth. And so, I, you know, I'm not going to I hate when our side plays victim. And I'm not saying that you're playing victim, but people say yeah, it was about getting Trump. Oh, really? Did, did, so was Trump forced to tell Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, uh, do not end the lockdowns. Um, my power is absolute and I, you're making a bad decision. Did the media force Trump to pursue lockdowns in general? 
you know, here was a chance for Trump for what, to act like Trump. People to this day, they say, well, Trump had done this differently if he hadn't been on Twitter so much or if he if, if he, you know, uh, hadn't been mean to John McCain and everything. No, no, no. That's why Trump's president today. You can't, you can, unless you were as obnoxious as he was, you would never have thought to run for president. But the one chance when Trump really needed to be Trump was in 2020 and say, wait, whatever you think about this virus, the last thing any reasonable person do would be to shut down the economy and, and foment economic desperation as the, as, the, as the virus mitigation strategy. So if Trump does this, if he sticks to no big deal, and says any governor so stupid as to lock down over this is going to have me as a regular guest in this state. I will get you knocked out of office so quick your, your head will spin. If Trump does this, he gives Republican governors cover to not do something that was just monumentally stupid, the lockdowns that made no sense. And he would have given global leaders to varying degrees the cover to not do what made zero sense. And he would still be president today. So no, I, I, I know there's a tendency, and I'm not saying you, there's a tendency that the media got him. No, 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 Trump got himself. And deep down, if he's got any kind of self-awareness or introspective qualities, he will go to his grave knowing that he got himself. He did not have to react the way he did. And if he didn't, he's still president. Well, we got to leave it there. I agree. I think Trump could have won on COVID. And I think with, as with other things, if he had trusted his instincts rather than being susceptible to the flattery of those around him, uh, he would have been better off. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the book is called When Politicians Panic by John Tamney. Again, this came out just this year in 2021, uh, published by Post Hill Press. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you're really nice, you might get an inscription in the front of it from John if you meet up with him somewhere, uh, which is why normally I give away the books after I'm done reading them. But this one I'm keeping because it's got a nice inscription. And, John, I just want to congratulate you. I think a great and very important book and very readable. And I hope I hope people get it and I hope they read it because it'll really give them a lot of ammo uh, for the revisionist history. We're all going to suffer, perhaps over the next couple of years. So, John Tamney, I want to thank you so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, you have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.